Hi, this is Ellie Fishman, and welcome to part four of Misdiagnoses. And I left off at this point before talking about mesenteric abnormalities, and I think this is one of the most common areas where misses occur, and these often are critical misses where you don't get a second chance. And this refers to things that involve the celiac axis, the SMA, branches off the mesenteric vessels, and in fact, even looking at the renal arteries. But it's really where I'm going to focus is on the celiac and SMA. Published an article a few years back now talking about how when you compared the axillary reports to the 3D reports, it was amazing how much pathology was missed on the axillary report. Now, I'm not talking about an accessory right hepatic artery. Forget about those. I'm talking about significant findings that resulted in a change in patient management in this series in 15% of cases. And we concluded that what you really need to do is routinely look at the sagittal views. And you just need to do that. So if I take some examples, mesenteric ischemia, you know, you need to really look at the, for occlusion. It can be arterial, can be uh, uh, embolism, can be thrombus. We always think about things as being in the proximal vessel, but it doesn't have to be. And your eyes tend to look at the proximal aspect of the vessel, but not follow it distally. So when I look at this case, you say, okay, look at the SMA, looks great. But it's only when you follow the SMA downward six or seven centimeters that you see a filling defect in the SMA and you realize there's a clot present. And in fact, when you do the 3Ds, you really see it well. Look at that patient's thrombus there. This was enough to infarct the bowel, right? You need to go in, you need to either do thrombolysis or remove the clot. But look how easy it is to miss. What's important here to notice also is the vessels look good. We always think about ischemic change or occlusion or stenosis on diseased vessels, but here the vessels are pristine except for the clot. The pitfall then is in suspected cases of ischemia, you need to make certain you're looking at the entire vessel, not just its proximal portion. If you can't define the entire vessel, you better make that clear and you better figure out why you can't define it. Let me emphasize that point again. Just because you don't see the vessel doesn't mean that it's normal. You know, maybe it's the thrombose, and that's the reason you don't see it. You need to be very, very careful. And I'll show you an example. This is a case of an outside study. It's a legal case. Patient has dilated small bowel. You're worrying about obstruction. And in fact, this loop coming across of um, jejunum really looks bad. It looks thickened, prominent fascia recta. you got to worry about ischemia, some process. Well, th they reported this as dilated, but they didn't mention anything about ischemia. You look at the vessels. Not the greatest injection, but in the first image, you see the SMA and SMV. But look at the second image. The SMA is clotted. It's subtle, I know. And if you go back and reconstruct, which they didn't do, you can see it on the sagittal view. There's the thrombus. Now, again, you need to be very, very careful. It's very easy to overlook. Like this case, abdominal pain. And you look at the vessels quickly, the, everything looks pretty good. The bowel looks good, there's no inflammation, there's no stranding. But if you look carefully at the sagittal view, you see the SMA for a moment, and then it's thrombosed. The entire SMA is thrombosed. The aorta looks great. The proximal SMA looks great. Look at the coronals, look at the thrombus in the SMA and into the branch vessels. Very nicely shown here, and then here's the axial images again on the venous phase. But look how easy it is to miss because you don't see a lot of the things you might expect to see. You don't see inflammation, you don't see stranding, but there it is. This patient had an acute thrombus, and this is something that was treated, and the patient, a few days later, the vessels are well-defined, but look how you would have missed it. Small little area of dissection in the vessel. But unless you're looking very carefully, it's so easy to miss. And this midline sagittal view is so critical to us. It's something you need to look at, whether it's SMA syndrome, or vascular stenosis, or median awkward ligament syndrome, or in staging malignancies. Unless you look at the sagittal views, you're going to miss or misstage pancreatic cancer. Looking for mesenteric aneurysms, mesenteric collaterals, 3D mapping is critical. Article by Zangos talking about the importance of coronals in the setting of acute abdomen, um, particularly important for less experience, but I'm telling you, I got a lot of experience, that's with all modesty, 
and uh, you still will miss things unless you're looking routinely at the coronals and sagittals. And I don't mean that if you have a question, you look at the sagittals or coronals. I mean every single case because most cases you don't have a question and so you're going to miss things. It's the coronals and sagittals that will give you the diagnosis. For the most inexperienced reader, the coronal reformations were helpful in 95% of cases, while for experience, they were helpful in 35%. But 35% is pretty good. You know, that's not too shabby. Diagnosing subtle pathology in the abdominal wall was difficult on coronals alone, but when I tell you look at coronals alone, coronals supplement the axials. Sagittals and coronals are critical. It's not just in the abdomen. Here's an article talking about head trauma and the importance of coronal sagittals to improve diagnostic confidence and inter-observer agreement. Here's an article on appendicitis. Transverse and coronals are equally specific for diagnosis of appendicitis. Coronals improve confidence in visualization of the appendix and in the diagnosis or exclusion of appendicitis. Same thing on that Paulson article. Combined transverse and coronal scans helped exclude appendicitis in uh, 38 patients and aided diagnosis in 15. So again, very, very important. And their conclusion, the development of multi-detector OCT and advancements in reconstruction software has allowed rapid high-res imaging of the entire abdomen and pelvis, resulting in MPRs with a spatial resolution similar to that of the axial plane. Again, the importance of routinely looking at coronal and sagittals are nicely defined in this article. Now, I also, uh, when we talk about errors, we also talk about bone. I think bone and soft tissue are one of the things that's very, very easy to overlook. It's one of those things that's kind of there, but not exactly there. Sometimes you know to look more carefully. The patient has history of breast cancer, or prostate cancer, or a renal cell. But, you know, if, unless you're looking at the sagittals and coronals, you're going to miss a lot of things only on the axial imaging. Um, you have to look specifically and carefully. you got to look at the sagittals. So if I show you this case, you know, abdominal pain, the spine looks okay. The patient's old. It's osteoporotic. There's vascular calcification in the aorta. But the sagittal view clearly shows you that L1 has collapsed. Recent article by Cadbury makes the point, most clinically important vertebral body compression fractures in non-trauma patients uh, may go unreported at abdominal CT if sagittal recons are not routinely evaluated. I mean, look at this. Look at their numbers. 2015 abdominal MDCTs, uh, vertebral compression fracture was not detected in 84%. Very, very important. You need to look at the sagittals for that reason alone. So look at the vessels, look at the bone. That's critical. Also, the point about looking at the soft tissues. Often you'll say that uh, the soft tissues are kind of at the periphery. It's kind of like the edges of a plain x-ray. Often they're cut off. We make certain we don't cut things off on the CT scan, and I quickly look at that area. Now, sometimes, you know, there's trauma, you know, to look there. Infection, you know, to look there. But hematomas, calcification, soft tissue tumors are all things that can be seen, but can be easily, easily missed. So that's a very important thing to look at. And for example, in this next case, you see that the patient had colon cancer. There's a little thing in the soft tissues and the axial imaging. Look how more impressive it is on the 3D maps. And when you look at that set of images, that was metastatic colon cancer to the subcutaneous tissues. I would have considered melanoma. That's probably more likely. But this was just a wonderful example of a patient with a metastasis. That's pretty uncommon from colon cancer, but I saw three of them in a two-week period, perhaps as patients live longer, we will see more of these soft tissue metastases. Now, one of the challenges, of course, when I talk about protocols is we're trying to minimize dose to the patient, and so people tend to cut corners, and I don't mean that in a bad way. We need to be certain that as we reduce dose, we don't reduce information. Certain studies are easy to reduce dose, lung nodule follow-up, virtual colonoscopy, the prone images, but in others, like with liver mets, you cut the dose too low, you're going to miss things. You don't do dual phase imaging, you're going to miss things. We need to make certain we do the study right the first time. You don't want to do phases that are unnecessary, but you want to do every phase that is indeed necessary. If you're only doing single phase acquisitions and doing all sorts of tricks, 
you know, it sounds good and you reduce the dose, but invariably the patient will get another scan and so the dose will be up. You want to make certain you do the study correctly. Now, going back to the first slide I showed you, could you imagine error rate 30% when there's positive findings? Are you missing 3 out of 10? I hopefully am not. In our study, the majority of errors were under-reading, where the finding was simply missed. Now, they talk about checklists as a way, perhaps, of not missing things. I think you're going to see checklists becoming more important. We're working on some stuff on the Apple Store with that. It's important to be able to think about what is it you miss. Look at the soft tissues. Look at the sagittal bone. Look at the lung windows. Look for a PE. That's looking at the abdominal CT, but not yet looking at the abdominal organs. You need to do all of that. And this idea by Kim talking about checklists maybe is a good sign for thinking about the things that we commonly overlook. So I'll conclude then to misdiagnosis and make the point. You need to be aware of the pitfalls. When you're aware of the pitfalls, you will do better. You must move away from axials only. You need to at least look at the coronals and sagittals even quickly, but you need to look at them. Hopefully we'll see new software which will make things easier, but I would not hold my breath in that regard. It's up to us now to really optimize how we look at things, really think of strategies, think about the pitfalls and the errors, and so when you read cases, make certain you don't do those pitfalls. We need to work closely with the technologists to make sure our scan protocols are perfect, adequate distension of the stomach and bowel, fast injection rates. We, for IV contrails, we need to make certain that we're looking at the coronals and sagittals and, and 3D when necessary. So it's really a constant learning and relearning process. And hopefully, in this four-part adventure, I have made things just a bit clearer for you. Now with that, have a great day.